Cultural Exchange by Keith Loma A Retief Tale Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, September 1962 Narrated by Tom Trissel 1. Second Secretary Magnan took his green-lined cape and orange-feathered beret from the clothes tree. "'I'm off now, Retief,' he said. "'I hope you'll manage the administrative routine during my absence without any unfortunate incidents.' "'That seems a modest enough hope,' Retief said. "'I'll try to live up to it. "'I don't appreciate frivolity with reference to this division,' Magnan said testily. "'When I first came here,' The Manpower Utilization Directorate, Division of Libraries and Education, was a shambles. I fancy I've made muddle what it is today. Frankly, I question the wisdom of placing you in charge of such a sensitive desk, even for two weeks. But remember, yours is purely a rubber-stamp function. In that case, let's leave it to Miss Ferkel. I'll take a couple of weeks off myself. With her poundage, she could bring plenty of pressure to bear. "'I assume you jest, Retief,' Magnan said sadly. "'I should expect even you to appreciate that Bogan participation in the exchange programme may be the first step towards sublimation of their aggressions into more cultivated channels. "'I see they're sending two thousand students to the land,' Retief said, glancing at their memo for record. "'That's a sizable sublimation.' Magnan nodded. The Bogans have launched no less than four military campaigns in the last two decades. They're known as the hoodlums of the Nicodemian cluster. Now, perhaps, we shall see them breaking that precedent and entering into the cultural life of the galaxy. Breaking and entering, Retief said. You may have something there, but I'm wondering what they'll study on the land. It's an industrial world of the poor but honest variety. "'Academic details are the affair of the students and their professors,' Magnan said. "'Our function is merely to bring them together. "'See that you don't antagonise the Bogan representative. "'This will be an excellent opportunity for you to practice your diplomatic restraint. "'Not your strong point, I'm sure you'll agree.' "'A buzzer sounded. Retief punched a button. "'What is it, Miss Ferkel?' "'That bucolic person from Lovenbroy is here again.' On the small desk screen, Miss Ferkel's meaty features were compressed in disapproval. "'This fellow's a confounded pest. I'll leave him to you, Retief,' Magnan said. "'Tell him something. Get rid of him. And remember, here at Core HQ, all eyes are upon you.' "'If I'd thought of that, I'd have worn my other suit,' Retief said. Magnan snorted and passed from view. Retief punched Miss Ferkel's button. Send the bucolic person in. A tall, broad man with bronze skin and grey hair, wearing tight trousers of heavy cloth, a loose shirt open at the neck and a short jacket, stepped into the room. He had a bundle under his arm. He paused at sight of Retief, looked him over momentarily, then advanced and held out his hand. Retief took it. For a moment, the two big men stood face to face. The newcomer's jaw muscles knotted. Then he winced. Retief dropped his hand and motioned to a chair. "'That's nice knuckle-work, mister,' the stranger said, massaging his hand. First time anybody ever did that to me. My fault, though. I started it, I guess.' He grinned and sat down. "'What can I do for you?' Retief said. "'You work for this culture bunch, do you? Funny. I thought they were all ribbon-counter boys. Never mind. I'm Hank Arapolis. I'm a farmer. What I wanted to see you about was—' He shifted in his chair. "'Well, out on Lovenbroy, we've got a serious problem. The wine crop is just about ready. We start picking in another two, three months.' Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Bacchus vines we grow. No, Retief said. Have a cigar? He pushed a box across the desk. Arapolis took one. 
Bacchus vines are an unusual crop, he said, puffing the cigar alight. Only mature every twelve years. In between, the vines don't need a lot of attention, so our time's mostly our own. We like to farm, though, spend a lot of time developing new forms, apples the size of a melon, and sweet. Sounds very pleasant, Retief said. Where does the libraries and education division come in? Arapolis leaned forward. We go in pretty heavy for the arts. Folks can't spend all their time hybridising plants. We've turned all the land area we've got into parks and farms. Of course, we left some sizable forest areas for hunting and such. Lovenbroy is a nice place, Mr. Retief. It sounds like it, Mr. Arapolis. Just what? Call me Hank. We've got long seasons back home. Five of them. Our year's about eighteen terry months. Cold as hell in winter. Eccentric orbit, you know. Blue-black sky. Stars visible all day. We do mostly painting and sculpture in the winter. Then spring. Still plenty cold. Lots of skiing, bobsledding, ice skating. And it's the season for woodworkers. Our furniture. I've seen some of your furniture, Retief said. Beautiful work. Arapolis nodded. All local timbers, too. Lots of metals in our soil, and those sulphates give the woods some colour, I'll tell you. Then comes the monsoon. Rain. It comes down in sheets. But the sun's getting closer. Shines all the time. Ever seen it pouring rain in the sunshine? That's the music-writing season. Then summer. Summer's hot. We stay inside in the daytime and have beach parties all night. Lots of beach on Lovenbroy. We're mostly islands. That's the drama in symphony time. The theatres are set up on the sand or anchored offshore. You have the music and the surf and the bonfires and stars. We're close to the centre of a globular cluster, you know. You say it's time now for the wine crop? That's right. Autumn's our harvest season. Most years we have just the ordinary crops. Fruit, grain, that kind of thing. Getting it in doesn't take long. We spend most of the time on architecture, getting new places ready for the winter or remodelling the older ones. We spend a lot of time in our houses. We like to have them comfortable. But this year's different. This is wine year. Arapolis puffed on his cigar, looked worriedly at Retief. Our wine crop is a big money crop, he said. We make enough to keep us going, but this year... The crop isn't panning out? Oh, the crop's fine. One of the best I can remember. Of course, I'm only twenty-eight. I can't remember but two other harvests. The problem's not the crop. Have you lost your markets? That sounds like a matter for the commercial. Lost our markets? Mister, nobody that ever tasted our wines ever settled for anything else. It sounds like I've been missing something, said Retief. I'll have to try them some time. Rappolus put his bundle on the desk, pulled off the wrappings. No time like the present, he said. Retief looked at the two squat bottles, one green, one amber, both dusty with faded labels and blackened corks secured by wire. Drinking on duty is frowned on in the core, Miss Rapolus, he said. This isn't drinking, it's just wine. Arapolis pulled the wire retainer loose, thumbed the cork. It rose slowly, then popped in the air. Arapolis caught it. Aromatic fumes wafted from the bottle. Besides, my feelings would be hurt if you didn't join me, he winked. Retief took two thin walled glasses from a table beside the desk. Come to think of it, we also have to be careful about violating quaint native customs. Arapolis filled the glasses. Retief picked one up, sniffed the deep rust-coloured fluid, tasted it, then took a healthy swallow. He looked at Arapolis thoughtfully. Hmm... It tastes like salted pecans, with an undercurrent of crusted port. Don't try to describe it, Mr. Retief, Rapolis said. 
He took a mouthful of wine, swished it around his teeth, swallowed. It's Bacchus wine, that's all. Nothing like it in the galaxy. He pushed the second bottle toward Retief. The custom back home is to alternate red wine and black. Retief put aside his cigar, pulled the wires loose, nudged the cork, caught it as it popped up. Bad luck if you miss the cork, Rappelus said, nodding. You probably never heard about the trouble we had on Lovenbroy a few years back. Can't say that I did, Hank. Retief poured the black wine into two fresh glasses. Here's to the harvest. We've got plenty of minerals on Lovenbroy, Rappelus said, swallowing wine. But we don't plan to wreck the landscape mining him. We like to farm. About ten years back, some neighbours of ours landed a force. They figured they knew better what to do with our minerals than we did. Wanted to strip mine, smelt ore. We convinced them otherwise. But it took a year, and we lost a lot of men. That's too bad, Retief said. I'd say this one tastes more like roast beef and popcorn over a Riesling base. It put us in a bad spot, Rappelus went on. We had to borrow money from a world called Crony, mortgaged our crops, had to start exporting artwork too. Plenty of buyers, but it's not the same when you're doing it for strangers. Say, this business of alternating drinks is a real McCoy, Retief said. What's the problem? Crony about to foreclose? Well, the loan's due. The wine crop would put us in the clear, but we need harvest hands. Picking Bacchus grapes isn't a job you can turn over to machinery, and anyway, we wouldn't if we could. Vintage season is the high point of living on Lovenbroy. Everybody joins in. First, there's the picking in the fields, miles and miles of vineyards covering the mountainsides and crowding the river banks with gardens here and there. Big vines, eight feet high, loaded with fruit, and deep grass growing between. The vine carriers keep on the run, bringing wine to the pickers. There's prizes for the biggest day's output, bets on who can fill the most baskets in an hour. The sun's high and bright, and it's just cool enough to give you plenty of energy. Come nightfall, the tables are set up in the garden plots, and the feast is laid on. Roast turkeys, beef, hams, all kinds of fowl, big salads, plenty of fruit, fresh baked bread, and wine, plenty of wine. The cooking's done by a different crew each night in each garden, and there's prizes for the best crews. Then the wine making. We still tramp out the vintage. That's mostly for the young folks, but anybody's welcome. That's when things start to get loosened up. Matter of fact, pretty near half our young uns are born after a vintage. All bets are off then. It keeps a fellow on his toes, though. Ever try to hold on to a gal wearing nothing but a layer of grape juice? Never did, Retief said. You say most of the children are born after a vintage? That would make them only twelve years old by the time. Oh, that's Lovenbroy years. They'd be eighteen, Terry reckoning. I was thinking you looked a little mature for twenty-eight, Retief said. Forty-two, Terry years, Rappelus said. But this year it looks bad. We've got a bumper crop, and we're short-handed. If we don't get a big vintage, Crony steps in. Lord knows what they'll do to the land. Then next vintage time, with them holding half our grape acreage. You hocked the vineyards? Yep, pretty dumb, huh? but we figured twelve years was a long time. On the whole, Retief said, I think I prefer the black, but the red is hard to beat. What we figured was, maybe you culture boys could help us out, alone to see us through the vintage, enough to hire extra hands. Then we'd repay it in sculpture, painting, furniture. Sorry, Hank, all we do here is work out itineraries for travelling sideshows, that kind of thing. Now if you needed a troop of Grachin nose-flute players, can they pick grapes? Nope. 
Anyway, they can't stand the daylight. Have you talked this over with the Labour office? Sure did. They said they'd fix us up with all the electronics specialists and computer programmers we wanted. But no field hands. Said it was what they classified as menial drudgery. Who'd have thought I was trying to buy slaves? The buzzer sounded. Miss Ferkel's features appeared on the desk screen. You're due at the intergroup council in five minutes, she said. Then afterwards, there are the Bogan students to meet. Thanks, Retief finished his glass. Stood. I have to run, Hank, he said. Let me think this over. Maybe I can come up with something. Check with me day after tomorrow. And you'd better leave the bottles here. Cultural exhibits, you know. 2. As the council meeting broke up, Retief caught the eye of a colleague across the table. Mr. Waffle, you mentioned a shipment going to a place called Crony. What are they getting? Waffle blinked. You're the fellow who's filling in for Magnin over at Muddle, he said. Properly speaking, equipment grants are the sole concern of the Motorized Equipment Depot, Division of Loans and Exchanges. He pursed his lips. However, I suppose there's no harm in telling you. They'll be receiving heavy mining equipment. Drill rigs, that sort of thing. Strip mining gear. Waffle took a slip of paper from a breast pocket, blinked at it. Bolo, model, WV-1. Tractors, to be specific. Why is model interested in medals activities? Forgive my curiosity, Mr. Waffle. It's just that crony cropped up earlier today. It seems she holds a mortgage on some vineyards over on. That's not medals affair, sir, Waffle cut in. I have sufficient problems as chief of medal without probing into models business. Speaking of tractors, another man put in, we over at Special Committee for Rehabilitation and Overhaul of Underdeveloped Nations General Economies have been trying for months to get a request for mining equipment for the land through medal. Scrounge was late on the scene, Waffles said. First come, first served. That our policy at medal. Good day, gentlemen. He strode off, briefcase under his arm. As the trouble with peaceful worlds, the Scrounge committeeman said. Bogey is a troublemaker, so every agency in the Corps is out to pacify her. While well, my chance to make a record, that is, assist peace-loving Deland, comes to naught. He shook his head. What kind of university do they have on Deland? asked Retief. We're sending them two thousand exchange students. It must be quite an institution. University? De Land has one under-endowed technical college. Will all the exchange students be studying at the technical college? Two thousand students? Ha! Oh, Two hundred students would overtax the facilities of the college. I wonder if the Bogans know that. The Bogans? Why, most of the land's difficulties are due to the unwise trade agreement she entered into with Bogey. Two thousand students, indeed! He snorted and walked away. Retief stopped by the office to pick up a short cape, then rode the elevator to the roof of the 230-storey Core HQ building and hailed a cab to the port. The Bogan students had arrived early. Retief saw them lined up on the ramp, waiting to go through customs. It would be half an hour before they were cleared through. He turned into the bar and ordered a beer. A tall young fellow on the next stool raised his glass. "'Happy days,' he said. "'And nights to match?' "'You said it,' he gulped half his beer. "'My name's Karsh, Mr. Karsh. Yep, Mr. Karsh. Boy, this is a drag, sitting around this place waiting. "'You meeting somebody?' "'Yeah, bunch of babies, kids, how they expect.' Never mind. Have one on me. Thanks. You a scout, master? I'll tell you what I am. I'm a cradle robber. You know. He turned to Retief. Not one of those kids is over eighteen. He hiccuped. Students, you know. Never saw a student with a beard, did you? Lots of times. You're meeting the students, are you? 
The young fellow blinked at Retief. "'Oh, you know about it, huh? I represent Muddle.' Karsh finished his beer, ordered another. "'I came on ahead. Sort of an advance guard for the kids. I trained them myself. Treated it like a game. But they can handle a CSU. Don't know how they'll act under pressure. If I had my old platoon—' He looked at his beer glass, pushed it back. "'Had enough,' he said. "'So long, friend. Are you coming along?' Retief nodded. Might as well. At the exit to the customs enclosure, Retief watched as the first of the Bogan students came through, caught sight of Karsh, and snapped to attention, his chest out. "'Drop that, mister!' Karsh snapped. "'Is that any way for a student to act?' The youth, a round-faced lad with broad shoulders, grinned. "'Heck no,' he said. "'Say, uh, Mr. Karsh, are we going to get to go to town? We fellows were thinking.' "'You were, huh? You act like a bunch of school kids. Uh, I mean, no. Now line up.' "'We have quarters ready for the students,' Retief said. "'If you'd like to bring them around to the west side, I have a couple of copters laid on.' "'Thanks,' said Karsh. "'They'll stay here until take-off time.' Can't have the little deers wandering around loose. Might get ideas about going over the hill, he hiccuped. I mean, they might play hooky. We've scheduled your re-embarkation for noon tomorrow. That's a long wait. Muddles arranged theatre tickets and a dinner. Sorry, Karsh said. As soon as the baggage get here, we're off, he hiccuped again. Can't travel without our baggage, you know. Suit yourself, Retief said. Where's the baggage now? Coming in aboard a crony lighter. Maybe you'd like to arrange for a meal for the students here. Sure, Karsh said. That's a good idea. Why don't you join us? Karsh winked. And bring a few beers. Not this time, Retief said. He watched the students, still emerging from customs. They seem to be all boys, he commented. No female students? Maybe later? Karsh said, you know, after we see how the first bunch is received. Back at the muddle office, Retief buzzed Miss Ferkel. Do you know the name of the institution these Bogan students are bound for? Why, the university at Deland, of course. Would that be the technical college? Miss Ferkel's mouth puckered. I'm sure I've never pried into these details. "'Where does doing your job stop and prying begin, Miss Ferkel? Retief said. "'Personally, I'm curious as to just what it is these students are travelling so far to study, at core expense. "'Mr. Magnan never—' "'For the present, Miss Ferkel, Mr. Magnan is vacationing. "'That leaves me with a question of two thousand young male students headed for a world with no classrooms for them. "'A world in need of tractors.' But the tractors are on their way to Crony, a world under obligation to Bogey, and Crony holds a mortgage on the best grape acreage on Lovenbroy. Well, Miss Ferkel snapped, small eyes glaring under unplucked brows, I hope you're not questioning Mr. Magnan's wisdom. About Mr. Magnan's wisdom, there can be no question, Retief said. But never mind, I'd like you to look up an item for me. How many tractors will Crony be getting under the medal programme? Why, that's entirely medal business, Miss Ferkel said. Mr. Magnan always— I'm sure he did. Let me know about the tractors as soon as you can. Miss Ferkel sniffed and disappeared from the screen. Retief left the office, descended forty-one storeys, followed a corridor to the core library. In the stacks, he thumbed through catalogues, pored over indices. "'Can I help you?' someone chirped. A tiny librarian stood at his elbow. "'Thank you, ma'am,' Retief said. "'I'm looking for information on a mining rig, a Bolo Model WV tractor.' "'You won't find it in the industrial section,' the librarian said. "'Come along.' Retief followed her along the stacks to a well-lit section lettered Armaments. She took a tape from the shelf, plugged it into the viewer, flipped through and stopped at squat armoured vehicle. "'That's the model WV,' she said. 
It's what's known as a Continental Siege Unit. It carries four men with a half megaton per second firepower. There must be an error somewhere, Retief said. The Bolo model I want is a tractor, model WVM-1- Oh, the modification was the addition of a bulldozer blade for demolition work. That must be what confused you. Probably, among other things, thank you. Miss Ferkel was waiting at the office. I have the information you wanted, she said. I had it for over ten minutes. I was under the impression you needed it urgently, and I went to great lengths. Sure, Retief said. Shoot. How many tractors? Five hundred. Are you sure? Miss Ferkel's chins quivered. Well, if you feel I'm incompetent. Just questioning the possibility of a mistake, Miss Ferkel. Five hundred tractors is a lot of equipment. Was there anything further? Miss Ferkel inquired frigidly. I sincerely hope not, Retief said. 3. Leaning back in Magnan's padded chair with power swivel and hippomatic concontour, Retief leafed through a folder labelled SERP 7602-BA, Crony, General. He paused at a page headed Industry. Still reading, he opened the desk drawer, took out the two bottles of Bacchus wine and two glasses. He poured an inch of wine into each and sipped the black wine meditatively. It would be a pity, he reflected, if anything should interfere with the production of such vintages. Half an hour later, he laid the folder aside, keyed the phone, and put through a call to the Crony Legation. He asked for the commercial attaché. Retief here, Corps HQ, he said airily, about the medal shipment, the tractors. I'm wondering if there's been a slip-up. My records show we're shipping 500 units. That's correct, 500. Retief waited. Ah, uh, are you there, Retief? I'm still here, and I'm still wondering about the 500 tractors. It's perfectly in order. I thought it was all settled, Mr. Waffle. One unit would require a good-sized plant to handle as its output, Retief said. Now Crony subsists on her fisheries. She has perhaps half a dozen pint-sized processing plants. Maybe, in a bind, they could handle the ore ten WVs could scrape up. If Crony had any ore, it doesn't. By the way, isn't a WV a poor choice as a mining outfit? I should think... See here, Retief, why all this interest in a few surplus tractors? And in any event, what business is it of yours how we plan to use the equipment? That's an internal affair with my government, Mr. Waffle. I'm not Mr. Waffle. What are you going to do with the other 490 tractors? I understood the grant was to be with no strings attached. I know it's bad manners to ask questions. It's an old diplomatic tradition that any time you can get anybody to accept anything as a gift, you've scored points in the game. But if Crony has some scheme cooking... Nothing like that, Retief. It's a mere business transaction. What kind of business do you do with a Bolo WV? With or without a blade attached, it's what's known as a Continental Siege Unit. Great heavens, Retief! Don't jump to conclusions! Would you have us branded as warmongers? Frankly, is this a closed line? Certainly. You may speak freely. The tractors are for transshipment. We've gotten ourselves into a difficult situation, balance of payments-wise. This is an accommodation to a group with which we have rather strong business ties. I understand you hold a mortgage on the best land on Lovenbroy, Retief said. Any connection? Uh, why, uh, no. Of course not. Ha ha. Who gets the tractors eventually? Retief, this is unwarranted interference. Who gets them? They happen to be going to Lavenbroy, but I scarcely see. And who's the friend you're helping out with an unauthorized transshipment of grant material? Uh, why, ah, uh, I've been working with Mr. Galva, a Bogan representative. 
And when will they be shipped? Why, they went out a week ago. They'll be halfway there by now. But look here, Retief, this isn't what you're thinking. How do you know what I'm thinking? I don't know myself, Retief rang off, buzzed the secretary. Miss Ferkel, I'd like to be notified immediately of any new applications that might come in from the Bogan Consulate for Placement of Students. Well, it happens, by coincidence, that I have an application here now. Mr. Galva of the Consulate brought it in. Is Mr. Galva in the office? I'd like to see him. I'll ask him if he has time. Great. Thanks. It was half a minute before a thick-necked, red-faced man in a tight hat walked in. He wore an old-fashioned suit, a drab shirt, shiny shoes with round toes, and an ill-tempered expression. "'What is it you wish?' he barked. "'I understood in my discussions with the other, ah, uh, civilian, there'd be no further need for these irritating conferences. "'I just learned you're placing more students abroad, Mr. Gulver. How many this time? Two thousand. "'And where will they be going? Crony. It's all in the application form I've handed in. Your job is to provide transportation. Will there be any other students embarking this season? Why, perhaps. That bogey's business. Gulliver looked at Retief with pursed lips. As a matter of fact, we had in mind dispatching another two thousand to Featherweight. Another underpopulated world, and in the same cluster, I believe, Retief said. Your people must be unusually interested in that region of space. If that's all you wanted to know, I'll be on my way. I have matters of importance to see to. After Gulliver left, Retief called Miss Ferkel in. I'd like to have a breakout of all the student movements that have been planned under the present program, he said, and see if you can get a summary of what medal has been shipping lately. Miss Ferkel compressed her lips. If Mr. Magnan were here, I'm sure he wouldn't dream of interfering in the work of other departments— I overheard your conversation with a gentleman from the Crony Legation. The lists, Miss Ferkel. I'm not accustomed, Miss Ferkel said, to intruding in matters outside our interest cluster. That's worse than listening in on phone conversations, eh? But never mind. I need the information, Miss Ferkel. Loyalty to my chief. Loyalty to your paycheck should send you scuttling for the material I've asked for. Retief said, I'm taking full responsibility. Now scat. The buzzer sounded. Retief flipped a key. Muddle, Retief speaking. Arapolis brown face appeared on the desk screen. How do, Retief? Okay if I come up? Sure, Hank. I want to talk to you. In the office, Arapolis took a chair. Sorry if I'm rushing you, Retief, he said, but have you got anything for me? Retief waved at the wine bottles. What do you know about Crony? Crony? Not much of a place. Mostly ocean. All right if you like fish, I guess. We import our seafood from there. Nice prawns in monsoon time. Over a foot long. You on good terms with them? Sure. I guess so. Course, they're pretty thick with bogey. So? Didn't I tell you? Bogey was the bunch that tried to take us over here a dozen years back. They'd have made it too if they hadn't had a lot of bad luck. Their armour went in the drink, and without armour, they're easy game. Miss Ferkel buzzed. I have your lists, she said shortly. Bring them in, please. The secretary placed the papers on the desk. Arapolis caught her eye and grinned. She sniffed and marched from the room. "'What that gal needs is a slippery time in the grape mash,' Arapolis observed. Retief thumbed through the papers, pausing to read from time to time. He finished and looked at Arapolis. "'How many men do you need for the harvest, Hank?' Retief inquired. Arapolis sniffed his wine-glass and looked thoughtful. "'A hundred would help,' he said. A thousand would be better. Cheers. What would you say to two thousand? Two thousand? Retief, you're not fooling. I hope not. He picked up the phone, 
called the Port Authority, asked for the dispatch clerk. "'Hello, Jim. Say, I have a favour to ask of you. You know that contingent of Bogan students? They're travelling aboard the two CDT transports. I'm interested in the baggage that goes with the students. Has it arrived yet?' OK, I'll wait. Jim came back to the phone. Here, Retief, it's here. Just arrived. But there's a funny thing. It's not consigned to de land. It's ticketed clear through to Lovenbroy. Listen, Jim, Retief said. I want you to go over to the warehouse and take a look at that baggage for me. Retief waited while the dispatch clerk carried out the errand. The level in the two bottles had gone down an inch when Jim returned to the phone. Hey, I took a look at that baggage, Retief. Something funny going on. Guns. Two millimeter needlers. Mark 12 hand blasters. Power pistols. It's okay, Jim. Nothing to worry about. Just a mix up. Now, Jim, I'm going to ask you to do something more for me. I'm covering for a friend. It seems he slipped up. I wouldn't want word to get out, you understand. I'll send along a written change order in the morning that will cover you officially. Meanwhile, here's what I want you to do. Retief gave instructions, then rang off and turned to Herapolis. As soon as I get off a couple of TWXs, I think we'll better get down to the port, Hank. I think I'd like to see the students off personally. 4. Karsh met Retief as he entered the departures enclosure at the port. "'What's going on here?' he demanded. "'There's some funny business with my baggage consignment. They won't let me see it. I got a feeling it's not being loaded.' "'You'd better hurry, Mr. Karsh,' Retief said. "'You're scheduled to blast off in less than an hour. Are the students all loaded?' "'Yes, blast you. What about my baggage? Those vessels aren't moving without it.' "'No need to get so upset about a few toothbrushes, is there, Mr. Karsh?' Retief said blandly. "'Still, if you're worried—' he turned to Herapolis. "'Hank, why don't you walk Mr. Karsh over to the warehouse and, ah, uh, take care of him?' "'I know just how to handle it,' Herapolis said. The dispatch clerk came up to Retief. "'I caught the tractor equipment,' he said. "'Funny kind of mistake, but it's OK now. "'They're being offloaded at the land. "'I talked to the traffic controller there. "'He said they weren't looking for any students.' "'The labels got switched, to Jim. "'The students go where the baggage was consigned. "'Too bad about the mistake, "'but the armaments office will have a man along in a little while "'to dispose of the guns. "'Keep an eye out or for the luggage. "'No telling where it's gotten to.' "'Here!' a hoarse voice yelled. Retief turned. A dishevelled figure in a tight hat was crossing the enclosure, arms waving. "'Hi there, Mr. Galva. Retief called. "'How's Bogey's business coming along?' "'Piracy!' Galva blurted as he came up to Retief, puffing hard. "'You've got a hand in this, I don't doubt. Where's that Magnan fellow?' "'What seems to be the problem?' Retief said. "'Hold those transports. I've just been notified that the baggage shipment has been impounded.' I'll remind you, that shipment enjoys diplomatic free entry. Who told you it was impounded? Never mind, I have my sources. Two tall men buttoned into grey tunics came up. Are you Mr. Retief of CDT? one said. That's right. What about my baggage? Galva cut in. And I'm warning you, if those ships lift without— These gentlemen are from the Armaments Control Commission, Retief said. "'Would you like to come along and claim your baggage, Mr. Galva? "'From where? I—' "'Galva turned two shades redder about the ears. "'Armaments?' "'The only shipment I've held up seems to be somebody's arsenal,' Retief said. "'Now, if you claim this is your baggage—' "'Why, impossible!' Galva said in a strained voice. "'Armaments? Ridiculous! There's been an error!' "'At the baggage warehouse—' Galva looked glumly at the opened cases of guns. "'No, of course not,' he said dully. "'Not my baggage. Not my baggage at all.' Arapolis appeared, supporting the stumbling figure of Mr. Karsh. What, "'What's this?' Galva spluttered. "'Karsh! What's happened?' "'He had a little fall. He'll be okay,' Arapolis said. 
"'You'd better help him to the ship,' Retief said. "'It's ready to lift. We wouldn't want him to miss it.' "'Leave him to me,' Gulver snapped, his eyes slashing at Karsh. "'I'll see he's dealt with.' "'I couldn't think of it,' Retief said. "'He's a guest of the Corps, you know. We'll see him safely aboard.' Gulliver turned, signalled frantically. Three heavy-set men in identical drab suits detached themselves from the wall, crossed to the group. "'Take this man,' Gulliver snapped, indicating Karsh, who looked at him dazedly, reached up to rub his head. "'We take our hospitality seriously,' Retief said. "'We'll see him aboard the vessel.' Gulliver opened his mouth. "'I know you feel bad about finding guns instead of school-books in your luggage,' Retief said, looking Gulliver in the eye. "'You'll be busy straightening out the details of the mix-up. You'll want to avoid further complications.' "'Uh, oh, yes,' Gulliver said. He appeared unhappy. Arapurus went on to the passenger conveyor, turned to wave. "'Your man is going to?' Gulliver blurted. "'He's not our man, probably speaking,' Retief said. "'He lives on Lovenbroy.' "'Lovenbroy!' Gulliver choked. "'But the—I—' I... "'I know you said the students were bound for the land,' Retief said. "'But I guess that was just another aspect of the general confusion. "'The course plugged into the navigators was to Lovenbroy. "'You'll be glad to know they're still headed there, even without the baggage.' "'Perhaps,' Gulliver said grimly, "'Perhaps I'll manage without it.' "'By the way,' Retief said, "'there was another funny mix-up. "'There were some tractors, for industrial use, you'll recall. "'I believe you cooperated with Crony in arranging the grant through medal. "'They were erroneously consigned to Lavenbroy, a purely agricultural world. "'I saved you some embarrassment, I trust, Mr. Gulver, "'by arranging to have them offloaded at the land. "'De land!' "'You put the CSUs in the hands of Bogie's bitterest enemies!' "'But they're only tractors, Mr. Galva. "'Peaceful devices. Isn't that correct?' "'That's correct,' Galva sagged. "'Then he snapped erect. "'Hold the ships!' he yelled. "'I'm cancelling the student exchange!' "'His voice was drowned by the rumble of the first of the monster transports "'rose from the launch pit, followed a moment later by the second. Retief watched them out of sight, then turned to Galva. "'They're off,' he said. "'Let's hope they get a liberal education.'" 5. Retief lay on his back in deep grass by a stream, eating grapes. A tall figure appeared on the knoll above him and waved. "'Retief!' Hank Arapolis bounded down the slope and embraced Retief, slapping him on the back. I heard you were here, and I've got news for you. You won the final day's picking competition. Over two hundred bushels. That's a record. Let's get on over to the garden. Sounds like the celebration's about to start. In the flower-crowded park among the stripped vines, Retief and Arapolis made their way to a laden table under the lanterns. A tall girl, dressed in loose white and with long golden hair, came up to Arapolis. Delinda, this is Retief, today's winner, and he's also the fellow who got those workers for us. Delinda smiled at Retief. I've heard about you, Mr. Retief. We weren't sure about the boys at first. Two thousand bogans, and all confused about their baggage that went astray. But they seemed to like the picking. She smiled again. That's not all. Our gals liked the boys, Hank said. Even bogans aren't so bad, minus their irons. A lot of them will be staying on. But how come you didn't tell me you were coming, Retief? I'd have laid on some kind of big welcome. I liked the welcome I got, and I didn't have much notice. Mr. Magnan was a little upset when he got back. It seems I exceeded my authority. Arapolis laughed. I had a feeling you were wheeling pretty free, Retief. I hope you didn't get into any trouble over it. No trouble, Retief said. A few people were a little unhappy with me. It seems I'm not ready for important assignments at departmental level. I was shipped off here to the boondocks to get a little more experience. Delinda, 
"'Look after Retief,' said Rapolis. "'I'll see you later. I've got to see to the wine-judging.' He disappeared in the crowd. "'Congratulations on winning the day,' said Delinda. "'I noticed you at work. You were wonderful. I'm glad you're going to have the prize.' "'Thanks. I noticed you, too, flitting around in that white nighty of yours. But why weren't you picking grapes with the rest of us?' "'I had a special assignment. Too bad. You should have had a chance at the prize.' Delinda took Retief's hand. "'I wouldn't have anyway,' she said. "'I'm the prize.' The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Do it. Just do it.